Welcome to another round of Prem and Proper here at SDH. It's the last Prem and Proper before the World Cup window. So we've got a lot to get through and a lot to get to before we get you ready for the final match week, 13 or 14, depending on what your favorite side is as we, we get you ready for uh, what's going on. So let's get back into the results. We've got to go backward before we go forward from the matches of the 5th and the 6th. It was uh, 11 o'clock starts across the board. Brighton with a big 3-2 win over Wolves. Wolves continuing to struggle. We'll have news on them coming up in just a little bit. Nottingham Forest and Brentford. This one was interesting all the way through for a bunch of different reasons. Brentford ended up with a 2-2 draw at Nottingham Forest at a plus 221. Thomas Frank, and I don't know if you saw this or not, this is courtesy of Brentford, their own selves in the Premier League, had to, to uh, deal with the grounds crew at uh, Nottingham Forest at City Ground, and they kind of disturbed his pre-match routine. Here's his thoughts on what went down. I think in all my time in football, and especially all the time in Premier League, I never, ever, ever seen groundsmen walking around in the middle of our warm-up uh, doing things. So I don't know if that uh, is a coincidence or a part of, I don't know, but it just surprised me very, very much. i never seen that. So I hope they do that every single time, also to Liverpool and West Ham and, and other teams. So they so, disrupting the wall, the ground stuff. Right? Yeah. 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 He's your goalkeeper coaching. Yeah, he got a mark. Manchester City and Fulham. Manchester City gets the 2 1 win uh, at a minus 556. They were down early in this one, as a matter of fact, 1 0. But Manchester City comes back for uh, the final result, gets all three points. Here's Pep Guardiola on Kevin De Bruno and his recent form. And Pep's pretty confident that uh, Kevin can. Sleep better these days. I don't want to see the Kevin De Bruyne in Bernabeu second leg. I don't want to see the Kevin De Bruyne in the Champions League against Chelsea. He was not involved. He didn't touch one ball, two balls. And it depends on him. Have the freedom to go pa pa in movement. And when that happened, and he's happier. Today he's happier. And Leicester is happier than the play before. One said, okay, man of the match or make an assist. He can make an assist all the time. But today it's not just the assist. It's not just the goal. He was, you know, there. And this is to have a manager I wanted for him. Today he will sleep like a baby. 100%. Happier, tired, like a baby. In the other days, the people highlight, oh, perfect assist. It's not enough. It's not enough. But I know them. You have to understand me. Seven seasons together. I know them quite well. Leeds and Bournemouth, absolutely crazy. Uh, Leeds was down 3-1, came back to win it 4-3 in one of the match of the year contenders with absolute certainty. Everton and Leicester. Leicester got the win by the score of 2-0. They needed that one as they're trying to climb out of the relegation zone. Leicester with a 2-0 win, and it didn't get better for Everton in the midweek as they got thumped by Bournemouth in cup action in the midweek. So a uh, long week for Everton and Frank Lampard. Leicester was a plus 195 on the board. Arsenal and Chelsea. Arsenal got the 1-0 win to start your action on Sunday the 6th. Crystal Palace with a 2-1 win over West Ham at West Ham. Wilfred Zaha had a sit-down with our friends at Sky, and he was asked about constantly being at the forefront of all the transfer news for Palace. I see so much. How many times have I seen myself, my name next to transfer stuff? <laughs> I, me, I never... I never speak on these things like my my contracts up. One of my contracts up. I'm a Crystal Palace player, and the only thing I'm focused on is just doing well for the club. So I can't sit here and say, "Oh yeah, this is my plan for this." And no, like I I'm I'm only fixated on what I'm gonna do tomorrow in training, and then what I'm gonna do on Sunday. So yeah, I'm I'm very devoted to Palace, and that's what I'm thinking about. Southampton and Newcastle, and this one pretty much. Uh solidified the future of Ralph Hassenhudel at Southampton. Newcastle had a tremendous day as a minus 119 at St. Mary's. So uh, Newcastle uh, gets the win. Southampton in the relegation fight. Ralph Hassenhutel was dismissed. We'll have news on that coming up in just a bit. After the dismissal, Sky caught up with Mohamed el Yunusi about how it was handled there on that day with the club. It's never a good situation, never a good thing to go through uh, obviously uh, for someone to losing a job uh, but I mean that's the na nature of football sometimes you know uh, it could be brutal and um, 
So, um, so yeah, it was tough. Uh, I had an emotional uh, meeting, um, you know, said our goodbyes and, uh, you know, wishing him all well uh, for the future. So it was Ralph that told you what had happened and then you had that moment where the players were able to say thank you to him and talk to him? Yeah, it was like that. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the club's decision. Uh, we still have to stick by it. Um, I mean, there's no argue about... Um, Ralph giving his uh, dedication, his passion, his energy for the club, uh, for the players. Uh, so, um, I mean, yeah, it's like I said, it's the nature of football. It can be tough sometimes and, uh, and I'm sure he's going to do well in, in the future. The club's been given permission to speak to Nathan Jones from Luton. Do you know anything about Nathan Jones? Uh, to be honest, I haven't read all about this, you know, rumours going on. Um, I'm very positive and, uh, that you know, the club is going to find the right person uh, to, to, to move us forward. Uh, so uh, up until someone is confirmed, uh, it's no point to talk about rumors or who's going to come in. Nathan Jones is coming up from Luton Town in the championship, and he will end up being the new manager for Southampton. Uh, Manchester United and Aston Villa. Aston Villa with the 3-1 win in the debut of Unai Emery on the touchline for Aston Villa. Gary Neville was asked about the uh, idea that Manchester United is back, courtesy of our friends at Sky. I'm not wholly convinced by United at all in terms of them. You know, this idea that Manchester United are back. They're not. They're not back. They're nowhere near the, you know, Manchester City, let's be clear. Um, more watchable. More. They're more watchable, and I think yeah. they've got a bit more fight. I think that yeah. you know a couple of the players who've come in, Ericsson's brought real quality in midfield. I think Martinez, to be fair, has done fantastically well at the back. He's brought a tenacity that even I think the part of the game I saw, there was a, I think he had a little bit. I can't remember who it was with one of the Villa players where he left them on the touchline. So he's brought a real tenacity back, but they keep getting injuries to the to his pairing. You know, he can't, get, he can't keep a steady pair. Varane gets injured and Maguire came in last week and then Lindelof's in, in midweek and today. So that's a real problem. Um, but Manchester United's front three, I think I said it actually last week, they are the weakest out of the top six. You know, you think of Kulisevsky, Kane and Son, Manchester United would definitely take those three. Arsenal's front three, Jesus, Martinelli and Saka, they'd definitely take over the three they have. Liverpool's front three of Nunez... You know, Diaz, Jota, uh, Salah um, and Firmino, he'd definitely choose three of them over United. Chelsea, I think Sterling, Havertz, I'm trying to think who else they've got up front there, Aubameyang, he'd definitely probably take those three even. So I think Manchester United's front players aren't as good as they should be. Um, Ten Hag, I think, is getting the maximum out of them. I don't know where the money's gone again, you know what I mean? I know I always feel like that with United. You look at the, the spend over the last four or five years, they're still not as good as they should be, but I think Eric Ten Hag, you know, he needs that two, three, four years in the job. He needs that three or four transfer windows because there's signs that they are getting better, but they're not back. They're getting better, but they're not back. Back is when you're seeing them sort of challenging the top, when they really are a fantastic football team. That's not happening at this moment in time. Eric Ten Hag will recognise that his team are far away from where he wants them to be. But there is spirit there. There is a tenacity in the team that hasn't been there in the first couple of weeks of the season that wasn't there and wasn't evident under Ralph Ranić. So there is things that are better, but they're not back. Final match on the board was on Sunday. Tottenham and Liverpool ended up with a Liverpool 2-1 win at a plus 106. A couple of different things having to do with this matchup. Michael Dawson was asked early on uh, in the weekend about the successes that you're seeing with uh, Antonio Conte in charge, and here's his response, once again, courtesy of our friends at Sky. I think it's, it will always be on Antonio Conte's terms. I do, I do believe that. I think that's just the way he is as a character. It, it's his way or the highway. Um, and you see it with the players, the way he demands. He doesn't care what people say from the outset. The way, way he sets up at times, it has been boring. But his results can't... You can't take away what he's done in, in one year. I think it was one year Wednesday, Jeff, that he, he, he came in. They were ninth mm. in the league and they had no chance of getting in, into the Champions League. So he turned that squad of players round and a team into a, a force, a force challenging. And now the third in the Premier League, in the last 16, I, I don't know how anyone can really be questioning him. I, I don't. Yes, times at football, and we saw it with Jose Mourinho, and it comes down to results. And when results don't quite go your way, 
that's when performances, that's when style of play can get questions. But this moment in time with Antonio Conte, I, I find it quite hard that people are. Do you think Be a lot of the negativity comes from because there'll be Arsenal are playing at this moment in time as well? Maybe, but I think Arsenal at the moment, that they're, they're playing far superior to what Spurs are. I think they Arsenal, they are there. Merce touched on it earlier. Spurs haven't hit the heights in performances that we probably all expected. I did at the start of the season. But they're third. Mm -hmm. and, they, and for me, they can only improve. I, the style of play, I don't think he will change. He'll never change because that's what he's, he's always done. So you're going to have to deal with it. My only concern now is, mm -hmm. since Kulosevsky has been out of the team, mm -hmm. I'm... Massive admirer of him, massive. Now Son's injured, so we, you think, right, they're going to no change. So Lucas Moura's come in, who will he, will he go with just Lucas and Harry Kane tomorrow? It's, it's a different game against Liverpool because we've a bit of questioned them. They aren't a million miles away neither. They can quite easily turn up tomorrow and give, give Spurs a, a, a tough game. Then a part of the discussion heading into the weekend had to do with all the uh, transfers and recruiting and all that was going on in the rotation of the roster. It was part of the discussion on the debate on Sky Sports Saturday. Jeff Stelling led it off and Clinton Morrison, Clinton Morrison responded once again, courtesy of our friends at Sky. Yeah, but last season, they won the FA Cup, they won the League Cup, they reached the Champions League final, they were beaten in the Premier League yeah. by a point. They brought in Darwin Nunez, they brought in Fabio Cavallo, and they only lost Sadio Mane, and a couple of bit-part players, with all due respect, Origi was a bit-part player. Yeah, he was. Minamino was a bit-part player. And if you looked at the season before, they brought in Luis Diaz and they brought in Ibrahim Akanate yeah. and they showed Shakiri and let Wijnaldum go for free. So, I mean, if you go back, go further back, you know, the season before that, they brought in Jota and Thiago and Simicas and out went Rian Brewster and Dejan Lovren. They have invested, haven't they? Maybe not in the way that Manchester City would do. And maybe not in the right areas. That's where I'd say the biggest mm, okay. areas. It's the right areas. But they needed to bring in a midfielder. <coughs> that was, it was, it was crying out for that. You said about the amount of games that they've played, Jeff, and all the finals they've got to. That's a lot of um, workload on the, their players and to do it week in week out consistently is re really hard and they've had they picked up injuries at crucial times as well I just think they needed to go and bring in a young midfielder and a J1 and we all know we talk about the player that they wanted and they probably couldn't get him at this moment in time was Jude Bellingham I think he would have been an outstanding signing for them because they've got some top quality midfielders in there but it's the legs around mm. them and that's where I feel it's been a struggle for them but you're right they have they are we always talk about it the likes of Mane but you're right they brought in Nunes but if you look at other people's recruitment, like Man City, they lose players. They go and identify the player they want. They bring him in. And that's why they can continue to be so successful. I still think Liverpool will finish in the top four. I just think they needed to strengthen in that midfield area. And they didn't in the summer. Not to be outdone, Jurgen Klopp was asked about his summer shopping spree. Look, the problem with interviews is that, um, or my, my answers for interviews is that if I, the things I say, people make a lot out of it. So I'm not uh, a big believer in looking back, thinking if we would have, that would have changed everything. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it, I think it's, it's clear that um, another player in a specific position would have helped in, 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 in moments, definitely. Mm. But um, one player barely can solve all the problems, and our problems now were not because um, we miss a player or something like that. Now we, now we miss, obviously, players, two, two strikers is... You go in a season, you play usually a 4-3-3, you have five strikers plus talents. It's, it's a good situation, it's a good situation. And all of a sudden, uh, you have three left and now you have to... Uh, and, and awful lot of games coming up. Yeah. So, of course, now it's easy to say, yeah, if we would have another one or in midfield or there, uh, if we would have had another one, it would have been great. We, we, went, we went into a season with five centre-halves and all of a sudden there were only two left. Um, <laughs> in moments, and you cannot prepare for everything. Yeah. Um, while it is wild and and um, irrational in moments, and, and football is the biggest and most important thing, I think we have the right amount of calmness as well. So we we we, we will we will get through this. But how I said, or we get out of it. But how I said a couple of times, when you want to get out of something, you first to get through it, and that's where we are still. <laughs> that's what we are still doing. But then the big news that came from the week was the notion that uh, Fenway Sports Group looks like uh, they're putting some feelers out. They're kicking the tires. They're putting it out there that maybe if someone was interested for the tune of $5 billion, that Liverpool could be for sale. Here was the uh, initial thoughts of our friends at Good Morning Soccer fans on Sky Sports. And the, the key thing about um, the message that's come from Fenway in the, in the time since is that there's no... 
uh, insistence that they're not for sale. Whenever there's been a, a story like this in the past, they've always been very, very quick to um, distance themselves from it. But yesterday, there was there was nothing of the sort. Um, the statement was very um, <clears throat> not ambiguous, but they were. It, it was it left you under no illusion that there there could possibly be a sale in the future, and that's what they're, uh, they're working towards. Well, the report suggests, and we can see it here as well, that this was uh, likely to happen as soon as the Super League was off the cards. Is that the case, Dominic? Um, Martin Samuels, um, our chief sports writer, has, has written a very forceful piece about that uh, about that subject um, on the inside spread. Um, listen, the, the Fenway have always been open to um, ideas of how they might be able to... Um, bring in investment and the Super League was is the thing that they will be most associated with. It was a, a, a terrible misjudgment of um, of the mood. Uh, it, it was far removed from what Liverpool as a club strive for in terms of Europe. Um, and that um, I, I, the fact that it is a year on uh, and there was it, it, significantly there was no denial yesterday when when these questions were, were put to Fenway. Um, they, they, they wouldn't say anything other than the the statement that they released, they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, entertain any kind of other questions. Um, so the fact that they, the, the, there was no um, explanation for it gives you all the, uh, the reasoning you need to see. Well, Dan, I'm sure you will have seen plenty of reaction to this one uh, on social media. You will have maybe had some Liverpool fans as friends and supporters that you think would have uh, had a, a voice on this. How has this news gone down with those Liverpool supporters? Yeah, the, the Liverpool fans that I know, I think I think they'd welcome some, some fresh investment. I think that they don't overlook the good that the group has done for Liverpool and under the ownership. Liverpool have had had a lot of success. There's been a lot of changes to the infrastructure, a lot of improvements to the stadium, and, and, and they've got a new training ground as well. So I think that's not lost on the Liverpool fans, but especially this season with the way it started, I feel there is a bit of frustration amongst the fan base that, that they feel that the kind of net spend and the spending is not up there with the, with the likes of Manchester City and at the moment the managers kind of echoed this as well, that they feel like they can't compete, so I think the Liverpool fans that I speak to and from what I've seen on social media, they'd welcome some form of fresh in, in investment and I think some of the success, some of the Liverpool fans I know, I think they, they kind of put that more down to Klopp than they do in the, in the ownership. So that sets up uh, your table after the weekend and the Liverpool win. So here's how things stand once again as we head into the last matches before the World Cup window. Arsenal on top. They've won 11 of 13, two points ahead of Manchester City. Each have played 13 matches. Manchester City's at 32 points. In third, Newcastle at 27. They've won four in a row, and they've played one more match than Arsenal or Man City, the two teams above them. Eddie Howe has an important anniversary. He's been at Newcastle for a year and was asked about it in his press conference this week. Yeah, it doesn't change. The, the league form is, of course, um, so important to us as well, but we want to do well in the, the Cups. Uh, in every competition we enter, we want to try and give the best uh, representation of ourselves. Um, I said uh, very early days here that uh, my dream is to try and win something for, the, uh, for Newcastle, and that hasn't changed. There's going to be a sellout crowd at St James's Park. It'll be a, a club record for a home match in this competition, um, which I think says everything about the appetite that there is for watching you at the moment. But after such a memorable first half of the season, is it nice to be at home this week with two big games to hopefully keep your supporters, well, make them happy and, and finish on a high before the World Cup? Yeah, I think naturally when you go into uh, the cup draw, you first thing you want um, is a home tie. So we're always uh, so proud to play in front of our own supporters. And I think when you have a, a quick turnaround, the, the three games in six days, the fact we've got the, the next two at home is a, a big lift for us. Eddie, um, today marks your official first year anniversary at the club. Congratulations. I, I wonder if we can just rewind briefly 12 months ago, did you ever envisage that the club would be in this run of form? What were the... What was the one area that you looked at instantly and thought that has to change if results are going to pick up? And what in your mind did you believe was achievable and realistic at that stage to where you are now? Quite a few questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the, uh, for the anniversary nod there. Yeah, I feel like I've uh, been answering these questions for a couple of weeks now. But um, I think uh, taking myself back, it was very much we knew we were in a big fight to stay in the league. And... 
I think when you know you're coming into that situation, I think there's a few fundamental things you need the team to deliver. And I think one of them was a you know, really, really good emphasis on our training and our training performances then morphing into how we played. So we wanted to be really solid. We wanted to try and prove our defensive record. Um, and that came down to really drilling the players on the training pitch and their attitude to that work from day one, as I've said many times, was so good. And I think that was where we tried to put all our emphasis into the work because we felt we had players that were capable at the other end of scoring goals. We just needed to try and uh, solidify the team, really. Tottenham is fourth. They've lost three of four, and they haven't been able to make any movement toward the top of the table. Spurs right now, 14 matches played and 26 points. That's your first group. Really, it's two little subgroups within your first group. Manchester United's at 23 points. They had a four-match unbeaten run snapped with that loss last time out. Manchester United, five. Brighton is your six at 21 points. They've won two in a row under Roberto De Zerbi. They have a goal difference of plus five. Chelsea is at seven under Graham Potter. They've lost two in a row. And, yes, you have the reactionaries who are sitting there wondering about the future of Graham Potter with a gnashing of teeth and clutching of pearls. Let it happen, folks. Chelsea right now, goal difference of plus one. They've lost two in a row, and they're also at 21 points. Liverpool right behind them, though, at 19. Three teams at 19 points. Liverpool with a goal difference of plus nine. Fulham at minus one. Crystal Palace at minus two. That gets you to 11, where Brentford is. They've drawn three of four, and they are at 16 points. Leeds, with their two wins in a row, are at 15 points in 12th. Minus three in goal difference. Four ahead of Aston Villa, who's at minus seven. 14 points have Leicester, who have now won three of four at 14 points and a goal difference of minus two. West Ham, a goal difference of minus three, and they have scored one more goal than Everton. That gets us to 17th and Bournemouth. They've lost four in a row. They've given up 32 goals in 14 matches so far this year. Then your relegation scrap. It is Southampton at 12 points. They've lost two in a row. Wolves at 10 points. They've lost three of four. Julian Lopetegui now takes over as manager for Wolves with this situation and Nottingham Forest with Steve Cooper giving up 30 goals, although that is not the most porous now, giving up 30 goals in 14 matches, but they've only scored 10. They are at the bottom at 10 points. Now, getting into your juice boxes for the upcoming weekend on the 12th, 7.30 Eastern time, Manchester City obviously a big favorite with Brentford coming to town. 10 o'clock. Bournemouth hosting Everton. Everton is a road favorite at a plus 161. Liverpool hosting Southampton, big favorite at a minus 385. Southampton currently basically a plus 1,000. Nottingham Forest hosting Crystal Palace at at, uh, City Ground. They're at a plus 213. Palace is a plus 142. Tottenham, big favorite at home, understandable at a minus 161 with Leeds visiting. West Ham a plus 106 at home with Leicester visiting. At 1230, Newcastle is a plus 135, waiting for Chelsea, who's a plus 210. Wolves is a a large underdog, understandably so. With Arsenal coming to town, Arsenal is a minus 179. Two matches on the 13th. Your two matches before we get everybody squared away and headed to getting ready to play their national games in Qatar. Brighton a minus 115, hosting Aston Villa at 9 o'clock, and then Fulham at Craven Cottage, hosting Manchester United. Manchester United is a minus 112. Uh, That should get you ready for everything on the final weekend of the Premier League sprint to the international window and everybody getting prepped for the World Cup. Once again, we will be back with Prem and Proper on the flip side as we get you ready for Boxing Day with all of your previews after the World Cup is completed. We'll get you ready for that as well. Thanks for hanging out with us here at SDH for all of the content that we produce. We'll be back at it once again tomorrow. So for everybody here at SDH, I'm just John Played Safe, everybody. Enjoy the games in the Premier League. That's another round of Prem and Proper.